Welcome, Connie, uh, to the Collaborative Research Center, Original Function of uh, Meat Organisms. Uh, is, uh, you are an alumni of the of this center. Uh, you are now in Denmark, and it's a great pleasure that we have you uh, for some scientific, but also personal in insights in your in your career. Thank you very much for, for taking your time. Before Thank you, Thomas, for the invitation. <laughs> Before we start uh, the, uh, talking to each other a little bit, um, I just very briefly introduce you. Um, you are German, but you got all your uh, basic academic um, trainings in Denmark. You got your bachelor in Denmark, you got your PhD um, in Denmark. And um, then you went for a postdoc uh, to Geomar um, Helmholtz Institute and um, it, it, in that during that time you were affiliated with our collaborative research center. And uh, you are now a senior researcher at the National Institute of Aquatic Resources in the center of ocean life and you have your own lab there. And for that many reasons, um, it's fantastic that we are together, um, at least virtually, in these strange times, and can talk a bit um, about your career, about your ideas, and maybe about the perspectives um, on the research you're doing from your point of view. And uh, maybe we start our conversation with uh, a very simple question, but how you are an ocean scientist, you are uh, fantastic and uh, internationally known, jellyfish expert. Um, how did you get into that field? How did it all start? Um, where did you find your questions? Uh, in childhood or as a postdoc here in Kiel? I guess not. Um, how did it all start, Connie? Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, Thomas. I'm very proud to, to talk about my yeah, personal and scientific uh, life today. And it actually started out when I was a small kid and could barely walk. My sister was eight years older than me, and she was always kind of uh, yeah, dragging me behind her to the ocean, but also to the horse stables. And she always wanted to become a, a marine scientist. Um, so for me, it was very clear before I could actually yeah, go to school or talk that, that I wanted to do something with the ocean. Because of the passion of my sister and all the, the stuff that she introduced to me, but then later on, people always said that, Connie, you can't live with the, without the ocean. And it's, it's clear that you are going to become a marine scientist. Well, that was the one part of my, of my story. Then, then comes the other part where my parents said that um, becoming a biologist is not really the best idea, <clears throat> especially considering that by, then, by that time, a lot of marine biologists were actually unemployed in Germany. So um, I went for a bank career as a starting point, did a bank internship, uh, became an officially um, certified bank clerk, was working in the private equity department at a well-known uh, Hamburg, uh, at, a, at a bank in Hamburg. Um, but very early, I decided that this is not the way I want to go. So I did a part-time study and working in, in the first place. And then at one point, I had to decide if I really wanted to become a marine biologist and go to the ocean, to a, to a country where you actually have experts around, which is obviously Denmark and not Germany. Um, or if I would like to stay, you know, at the bank and, and, and doing a part-time job. So I decided to follow my passion, signed up for a, a master education in Denmark. And from there, it actually, yeah, I was dedicated to contribute or to, to have my life surrounded by the ocean and, and uh, investigate it. Thank you very much. Um, as I know, you are still uh, even living very close to the ocean. So um, that's a fantastic uh, beginning of a career which already has made major contributions uh, to the field. Could you summarize for our listeners uh, in a very few sentences, what do you think are the major contributions and most exciting contributions from your side of um, the research? So I actually entered a research field um, that a lot of people regard as unimportant. Um, I'm dedicated mm -hmm. to the gelatinous organisms of the ocean that people think are a dead end and of no importance for higher trophic levels like fish production. Um, but during my master work, I actually found out that they can contribute more food to higher trophic levels compared to fish. 
Um, and this gelatinous topic was carried throughout my entire research career. And I was very proud that um, when I moved to Kiel, that um, there was this active um, collaboration within the CRC far before I actually started to be associated member, where we actually looked at the contribution of microbes to the fitness of jellyfish. And we also found, for example, that um, certain invasive jellyfish are not only a threat to the ecosystem because of their invasive nature, but also because they carry microbes, which can be pathogenic and, and very troublesome, to, for example, aquaculture um, activities. So basically, um, I have been working with gelatinous organisms from a lot of different perspectives. And I'm very, very happy that I was allowed to actually look from different angles with a suit of different techniques at the overall arching question, what do jellies do in our oceans? Thank you very much. Uh, there are two aspects I would like to go a little bit more deep. One, of course, uh, one of your exciting uh, observations is that there is um, at least correlations or questions on the significance of microbes for invading species. And uh, so is that something you are pursuing now? I mean, uh, do, do colonizing microbes play a role in adapting organisms so that they can invade um, foreign territory? Exactly. That's a very, very intriguing question. And as a bit of a background to this, we have a very troublesome um, invasive jellyfish um, in the Baltic Sea, which actually led to huge ecosystem changes in another invaded ecosystem, the Black Sea. And when this uh, jellyfish was uh, recorded in Northern Europe for the first time, we were fearing that now we have a lot of trouble in our waters uh, regarding fish production, ecosystem health. And it turned out that these jellyfish can't reproduce in our waters but they can reproduce in the other invaded areas. So we were in investigating um, the effect of microbes on the host fitness and if microbes could help to actually contribute adaptation potential to, for example, salinity stress. Very exciting results. Uh, so far, it's only correlative where we could see that the microbes significantly differ uh, with regard to salinity. Um, but we are still tearing the results apart and trying to understand what the mechanistic interactions are. So no news from that front. But another very interesting microbe story is the fact that European eel, um, they are a highly endangered um, species similar to, to tigers that are basically on the red list um, of uh, um, threatened um, close to extinct species. They swim over to the Sargasso Sea for spawning, um, but it has never been achieved or, or um, the life cycle was never successfully closed in the laboratory. And uh, when we were over there, we actually wanted to investigate what is um, what, what do these larvae actually feed on? And we found out that a major contribution of the diet, more than half of the gut content is comprised of jellyfish. Mm -hmm. So another very interesting angle could be to investigate if it's only jellyfish that are actually important from mm -hmm. a nutritional perspective, or if it's the microbes on these jellies that help the eel larvae actually to grow. And this could be a key to actually grow these uh, um, highly endangered species in the laboratory and close the cultivation cycle in, in, yeah, in, un, under artificial conditions. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. Uh, that's a, a fantastic and a promising way in the future. Yes, just wonderful. Um, you mentioned earlier um, that it's, of course, in the, the research you are doing, we are doing is pretty competitive and uh, one has to think about technologies and uh, methods and um, approaches how to get um, fast but also deep uh, to some novel informations. How much uh, technology is needed? Or, the, or let me ask the other way around. How important is technology and uh, methods, um, equipment uh, in uh, the research you are doing and uh, what do you need for doing this type of research? Yeah, I might have a small interesting kind of anecdote to this. <laughs> I was in an, uh, on a Russian icebreaker together with an American colleague. I have and read I that, found... yeah. I have read that in your CV. That's a, we are not talking about politics today, um, but well, be, being on a Russian icebreaker is, is in these days something very interesting. Okay, yeah. 
it was Sorry. interesting from a lot of different perspectives. And mm -hmm. it was also interesting because it was a Russian-American joint um, um, expedition. Mm -hmm. um, but the eye-opener was actually the conversation I've had with uh, with my mentor, Ross Hopcroft, who took me along. Because we had around a, a, a kind of um, district, uh, around, around the table where we should introduce ourselves. And I said that I'm a marine biologist. And then Ross came to me after and said, no, Connie, you're not a marine biologist. And I said, why not? I'm working with animals that live in the ocean. He said, you are a biological oceanographer. And I said, okay, so what is the difference? <laughs> and then he explained to me, biological oceanographers, they go out on the large, on the oceans with large boats. And marine biologists, you know, they go out with small boats or rubber boats or dinghies or something like that. But they have no clue what's going out in the vast area of our blue planet. So I'm a biological oceanographer and said that, I mean, um, we just got an application through <clears throat> for 750,000 US dollar, which is basically only covering more or less the ship time of an ice icebreaker for one and a half weeks. So you can see that during the kind of research um, is, uh, demands a lot of infrastructure to get to these vast areas. But then it's also the challenge to actually apply novel techniques such as whole genome resequencing to actually go to the basis um, of, uh, of, the, um, of the unknowns. I mean, it's not only the species that are living out there, it's also their genetic repertoire and the history which is encoded in, this, in these genes and in their genetic information that we can now unravel with uh, novel sequencing techniques. So coming back to my time in Kiel, I think it was extremely inspiring to work together with molecular biologists, with modelers, with a lot of microbiologists who are used to look at the tiniest organisms in the water um, and to really compile this knowledge and, uh, and come up with uh, new ideas. So um, yes, it's important to have access to good infrastructure and it's much more important to have access to enthusiastic people to actually discuss science, to get ideas and establish collaborations. And for this, I was extremely grateful to you, Thomas, and the College Research Center because it was a, an opener to a new world that I might not have entered without you. Thank you very much. And I just give it back and say that you are a wonderful alumni now and uh, we are um, yeah, also relying on you and your your ideas and the input for the future success of the center. Um, now, we have already entered a kind of more the, the personal view of your career and life, and uh, you certainly are, and all what you are, have talked now, are a role model for many junior researchers, uh, undergrads, grad students, uh, doctoral students who are still thinking, um, would I, will I make it, uh, what does it need? Uh, and uh, how much effort is that? What is the future? I mean, uh, from your point of view, Connie, what you are a role model. Um, and uh, if you are, just think of a bit and say in a very few sentences if out of your gut, what does it need uh, to be successful? What does it need to make this kind of um, career which you have presented us and make these tough decisions uh, going from Hamburg and from the bank uh, to a marine institute in Denmark and uh, etc. What does it need to be successful from your point of view? I think you need to be passionate about what you do. This is not a it's not a job. It's a pro, it's a profession. You need to be you need to be dedicated and say that I'm not counting the hours from nine to five like I used to do in the bank, where you have a job and where you have to uh, have different duties that that need to be done and certain targets that need to be achieved. Science is about curiosity and it's about finding answers. And I think it's a gift that I'm allowed to work as a scientist because it is. It is like a detective. Each day you go out and try to find the answers to things and to questions that rise in front of your eyes everywhere. And um, trying to, uh, <clears throat> to find the right questions and trying to be in the laboratory to make the right experiments to actually understand what's happening. I think this is, um, this is fantastic. And everyone who would like to become a scientist has to be prepared that it's an extremely long and very tough way. <clears throat> but if you're passionate about what you do and if you love it, then you'll make your way. And um, I once heard, <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying who, who said it, but a, a very bright um, person also from the Collaborative Research Center once said to me, Connie, if people would have told me back then that everything will be good in the end, 
I wouldn't have had so much stress when I was at Harvard and all the other universities because, and I think that's true. I think if you're dedicated and passionate and good, then you make your way. But it's also part of the entrance. I mean, being a scientist is also questioning stuff and questioning yourself. And this questioning can sometimes also take too much. And I'm also questioning myself. So I think it's healthy to question yourself, <clears throat> but um, it needs to be balanced. So uh, a good scientist should just uh, yeah, be passionate about that this is the right stuff he wants to do and forget the time in the laboratory and just... Um, that's a good sign. Yeah, uh, I think uh, this is, uh, everybody will agree, and this is wonderful, and uh, it, it makes you an authentic uh, authentic person who is happy with uh, what uh, where she is right now. Uh, nevertheless, uh, and I like the this citation which you just said, because at the end, if you look back, everything looks just wonderful, and you wouldn't have worried so much about all the ways. But uh, there are always, one shouldn't, take it too easy and tell the young people that everything is so easy. There are obstacles, uh, there are challenges which one has to overcome. Could you think of a, a few challenges which were in your way or obstacles and, uh, and uh, then one has to think, uh, is it worthwhile to go on or is that a turning point in my career? And, you know, careers have many different uh, can be very colorful and 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 uh, full of full of new directions, um, but um, I'm sure there were obstacles and and challenges in your in on your way. Yes, and I think that's also part of the process, and is also important because these challenges make you grow <clears throat> when you overcome them. Um, I would just like to go one step back and say what I tell students is that. If you enjoy to read and to write, and if you're good at writing and analyzing, then you should go on with a PhD. But if you have problems writing and if you do not like to write, then being a scientist is not the right profession for you because you need to communicate your research results. And this is just an, yeah, this is just, I think, the highest hurdle for most people to actually be able to communicate their findings. And in science, this is via the written language. But it's not only we are writing papers, it's also we are writing grants. And you can only be successful and remain in science if you make sure that you get your own funding secured. And um, when I did my PhD, I was actually, back then, I was a bit disappointed because my supervisor, Thomas Gerber, he is one of the 0.5% most cited scientists in his field, but he said to me that, Oh, Connie, you want to go abroad? Yeah, you actually have to do that, but um, there is no money in your project, so you better start to write proposals. So I had to write four proposals to actually be able to go to Sweden and um, to buy the equipment that I wanted to get and all that stuff. And he was supporting me, of course, with the writing process. And looking back, I think this was just the largest gift I got from Thomas because I got introduced into this competitive environment and how to actually secure your own money and if you write proposals you have to do the reporting and all these things which actually lie the foundation for continuing your science and um, giving advice to young people and coming back to the question about obstacles on my way continue with your own um, funding and being independent if you have this driving force that you want to pursue your dreams and your ideas and not to be dependent on a supervisor um, who might have different ideas. Was there maybe even a day or a night where you thought uh, that's now, I'm not sure if I should continue or were there never any doubts? I never thought about giving up because this is my life and this is my passion. And I think it's very important to remember that if you go your way, there are a lot of people that actually want to support you and that are also supporting you. And personally, I can just say that the CRC was a fantastic step for my career because there were so many very well-established and excellent scientists that were willing to support the young people and that supported me and that supported others as well. So I think that if you're really passion, passionate about what you do, if you really know that this is what you want to do, um, then this strength will carry you over all the sad moments. 
excellent point and also an uh, excellent advice. Um, coming back to one key word which you had, uh, which you mentioned, and that is uh, communication. I think uh, this is certainly something which uh, any scientist these days uh, has to do, and he, she or he has um, to have the skills to communicate, um, not only to the people from their own discipline, but and that would be my next question. Um, it's getting more and more at least in my view, important to talk to people from, from other disciplines. And then here we are in the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity, etc. Now you spend some time on a Russian-American ice breaker and um, sure you learned very early on um, uh, to talk um, to people from different disciplines. How important is today uh, the community outside your own community for making progress in your own research? Yeah, much more important. I think sometimes I'm a bit overwhelmed because I have the feeling that there are no boundaries anymore between different disciplines. In the old days, you had the fisheries biologists who were partying hard. Then you had the biological oceanographers that disappeared for months on different areas of this planet and came back with a lot of hair in the face, <laughs> a bit strange. And then you had these different disciplines. But I have the feeling that these disciplines don't exist anymore. I, I have the feeling that everything, the boundaries are broken and we are all, we all sit in one, in one boat. The applications need to be bigger and bigger and bigger and transdisciplinary. But I think this also, this was a force in the start that people had a lot of problems with. But I think looking back now, this force actually led to, to a transition that science really became transdisciplinary. And I think that only by you know, breaking these boundaries, talking across different um, disciplines, um, only uh, by this approach, we are able to actually bring science to new, to new levels. Fully agree. Um, one more point to uh, communication and uh, the uh, ability to, to talk to other people. And that is our now two-year pandemic which is a major challenge to uh, communication. Of course, we are doing this interview now uh, virtual on, 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 on cameras and you are sitting in Denmark and I'm sitting in, in, in Germany. Um, how did you cope with the pandemic in your personal life and in your personal academic uh, daily working? So <clears throat> to start with, I was so disappointed that we couldn't do this in person <laughs> because of the pandemic and... <laughs> Um, but I think everyone gets tired of being distant and social distance, distance from other people. But on the other hand, the pandemic also was a huge eye opener for myself. I mean, for example, we are now working <laughs> across the globe on a review paper with people from Australia, Alaska, Europe, and, um, and Asia. And this would have, this would have been impossible before the pandemic because we had this mindset that people needed to meet in order to be productive and to actually um, sit down and work together. But for my experience, I can say that this pandemic actually moved the world closer together. And I'm much more interacting with my colleagues all over the world that I normally only see yeah, once or maybe twice um, every one, two years. <clears throat> um, and this was a, was a huge advantage. Having said this, it's also a challenge I have a group now, there are seven to 10 people in my lab. And it's also a challenge to really make sure that the science and the lab work, con lab work continues and to have a remote supervision. And even though we have this weekly meetings, um, it, reminds, it remains really, really challenging. Um, so I think the young people and the young researchers really suffered from this pandemic because most of them were not established and had no large network to actually easily chat with. And we're still dependent on this interaction action, uh, where you need to have a face-to-face -face communication. Um, so I have, I have a laughing and a whining face to this. <laughs> yeah, so as, yeah. as we all, I mean, yeah, mixed feelings. But there is, there, I fully agree, there is also, you know, we learned how to use the digitalized world and how yeah, and, um, communication across the globe certainly made a big step forward um, 
um, in this in these last two years. I, I fully agree. Um, we are getting close to the end of this of this interview, and I wanted to to close the circle from your first uh, from your passion to the ocean and your passion to get into an, an academic uh, oceanographic uh, marine education. Um, to your already important contributions from your current research and ask you for a perspective view on where you think will your research be in five or in 10 years time? So we are currently working on establishing links in the food web that have so far not been touched at all. So basically people think that jellyfish are a dead end in the food web. So as soon as you have an ecosystem that's taken over by this blob of the ocean, as people normally say, it's lost. No fish is going to eat it. Um, but we have actually shown with the eel larvae that they feed on jellies. And also we are now in the process of uh, trying other fish uh, using molecular work um, to look at gut content. And I would really like to establish these links that jellyfish are not a dead end in the food, that web, food web, but that they're actively preyed upon by fish. And this also means that if we have a change of the ocean due to global change and we have a jellification of the ocean, this doesn't necessarily need to be bad. This can also just mean that there is a different energy pathway and there are different fish species that will be um, favored in the future, but it doesn't necessarily need to be bad. But we need to establish these links. And without these links, we basically currently can't predict what the future productivity of our ocean will be what the carbon export of the ocean will be. We have animal groups where I did my master's um, work with, they produce up to 24 houses around them per day to be able to feed on organisms that are similarly small, like the lean whale and krill. And these animals can have a huge impact on the carbon export and thereby um, for the CO2 uptake capacity of the ocean. But people do not care about it. And ocean um, scientists, they close the eyes because they are so difficult to work with. So in 10 years from now, I would love that these understudied groups are on the agenda of, um, of other scientists, that we enlarge the community to actively work and consider these animals, and that they're taken up into food web models that we can better predict the future of our ocean under global change. What a wonderful and a promising and an optimistic view uh, um, to the future. And I'm, I wish you all the very, very best. Uh, we are all very happy and proud uh, that you got, uh, that you spent some time of your career here at the uh, Collaborative Research Center and uh, that your research is continuing, continuing as, uh, as uh, successful as it uh, did it in the last few years. Thank you so much uh, for coming and joining us, Connie. Thank you, Thomas.